Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, the next uh, topic we consider is the interaction of dislocations with point defects. Uh, as we know that dislocations have long range elastic stress fields and point defects are associated also with certain kind of stress fields because typically any point defect uh, even if you consider substitutional atom will be different in size as compared to the host atom and will therefore result in a stress field. Um, in these cases of course, we have to differentiate the stress field of a substitutional atom from that of the uh, interstitial atom. Typically, substitutional atoms have a spherical distortion field, while interstitial atoms, which are interstitial voids, have apart from a spherical component, certain shear component also associated with them. This implies that point defects can actually interact with the elastic stress fields of a dislocation, and this interaction can lead to certain kind of segregation or certain kind of attraction to start with. So, defects associated with tensile stress are attracted towards the compressive region of the stress field of an edge dislocation. Um, and as I pointed out screw dislocations have only a shear stress field and therefore, if a defect has a shear stress field it can interact with the shear stress field of a screw dislocation. Otherwise, if the uh, stress field of the defect is purely dilatational or hydrostatic then it cannot interact with the screw dislocation. The solute atoms therefore, can actually segregate to the core region of an edge dislocation and can lead to the formation of an cotteral atmosphere. So, this kind of an uh, higher concentration of the solute elements um, in the region of the core of the dislocation is called a cotteral atmosphere and this cotteral atmosphere has impl important implications to the behavior of the material when you load it in tensile stress. That means, if you plot a uh, stress strain diagram in the absence of the solutes and in the presence of these solutes uh, elements then there will be considerable difference and we will take up the difference very soon. The reason that we need to uh, the main important difference you will see that we actually require higher stress to move the dislocation once there is a segregation of the dislocation to the core of the dislocation. Because now the segregation would mean that the system has gone into a lower state of energy and if I have to pull the system out of this energy well then I have to apply a higher stress. And in this case as we know to move a dislocation we need to apply shear stresses at the atomic level. Also, we know that the dislocation core is associated especially if you are talking about an edge dislocation and the region just below the half plane, then that region is a region of extra volume or a free volume and therefore, that region can e nicely accommodate certain small interstitial atoms as compared to the normal lattice wherein which is uh, wherein you require a certain higher energy to accommodate the interstitial atoms. An important example of this case of this interstitial elements is the non spherical distortion field of the BCC carbon uh, carbon atom in BCC ion and this can interact with screw dislocations. And as we shall see that this kind of a segregation of these carbon atoms in BCC ion leads to an alteration of the shape of the stress strain diagram. Now, let us start with an interaction of vacancies with the uh, stress field of the edge dislocation. So, in the figure below you can see that actually I am showing the sigma x x stress field around an edge dislocation. So, the dislocation line is into the plane of the board right at the center here and so let me mark that. So, this my edge dislocation is right at the center and you can see that the entire half space above is tensile in nature and the entire half space below is compressive in nature. So, this is my compressive stresses below and my tensile stresses are above and we know that this complete half space being tensile or compressive is in the case of edge dislocations in an infinite medium. If you have a finite medium or certain other uh, possibilities then this kind of a beautiful picture which is very symmetrical. There is a top down inward symmetry that means a symmetry that uh, 
the, uh, the top half space is compressive, the bottom half space is or in this case tensile and compressive and you also have the left right symmetry would be broken in certain other cases. Now, um, what happens to vacancies when they are present very near or near a edge dislocation? They actually use, as you can see that vacancies are associated with tensile stresses and they are therefore attracted to the compressive region of the edge dislocation. That means that suppose I have a vacancy sitting here, then it will tend to move towards the compressive region. That means it will tend to move this because there is a gradient in the stresses and it can lower its energy as it go moves towards the uh, core of the dislocation or towards the dislocation line. The behavior of sub smaller substitutional atoms is also similar to that when it, now we are talking about substitutional atoms smaller than the parent atoms is also similar to that of vacancies. Largest substitutional atoms will be associated with compressive test field and actually they will be attracted towards the tensile region of the dislocation. And if you are talking about interstitial atoms and they are also typically interstitial atoms as you know are larger than the voids in which they sit typically we have seen that in FCC crystals for instance the voids are the tetrahedral and the octahedral void and these interstitial atoms are typically larger than those voids and therefore, they are associated with compressive uh, stress fields apart from as I told you they can also be associated with some shear stress fields and therefore, these interstitial atoms are attracted towards the tensile region of the edge dislocation. So, um, and they are repelled from the compressive region of these um, edge dislocation stress field. So, let us look at the complete picture for vacancies revising it. So, vacancies are attracted towards the compressive regions are repelled from the tensile regions and you know there is a zero line of stress field right at the middle for instance and there is only one single zero line when you are talking about an edge dislocation in an infinite medium. So, if a vacancy sits on this dislocation line suppose I am talking about a vacancy sitting right at this point then it will not interact with the uh, dislocation stress field in other words it will remain unaltered it will not feel the force of the dislocation. So, in a sense um, this elastic interaction between a point defect and a dislocation stress field um, can lead to attraction or repulsion or some in or in very special cases no interaction also and this attraction or repulsion can actually lead to uh, an assisted diffusion of these point defects towards or away from the dislocation and the most important case of this is a case wherein there is an attractive interaction of the solute atoms of carbon towards the edge dislocations in uh, BCC ion. So, that is a very important example. So, if I write down the ca character table of the kind of point effect on the left hand side and the kind of interaction uh, with them. So, we can see that a vacancy is repelled from the tensile region and attracted towards the compressive region. An interstitial atom behaves right in the opposite way, it is attracted towards the tensile region and repelled from the compressive region. A smaller substitutional atom behaves similar to the vacancy and is repelled from the tensile region and attracted towards the compressive region. A point defect which is larger than which consists of larger substitutional atoms than the host atom is attracted towards the tensile region and repelled from the compressive region and in this sense it is similar to an interstitial atom. But as I told you there is a fundamental difference between interstitial and substitutional atoms that the distortion field of an interstitial atom might have a shear component and hence it can also interact with screw dislocations typically. So, what happens when I have for instance a carbon uh, carbon atom solid solution in uh, BCC ion. So, what can happen is that these interstitial atoms the carbon can actually segregate to the core region of the dislocation and preferentially come and sit in this region. Of course, we are seeing one atom here, but what we mean is that along this direction into the plane of the slide lot of atoms can come and sit near the core of the dislocation and this is what which I pointed out is called the quartal atmosphere. So, there is an atmosphere of these atoms around the core in the core region of the dislocation and overall this results in the lowering of the energy of the system because now the tensile uh, stress field if so you go back to the character table uh, the uh, compressive stress field of the interstitial atom will cancel the tensile stress field of the dislocation and therefore, you will have a lowering of the energy. And now, if I what is this, the signature of this on the stress strain diagram? Now, suppose I do a stress strain diagram for instance in aluminum. So, let me draw for instance a typical stress strain diagram of aluminum. You would notice that pure aluminum for instance or commercially available aluminum, then you would notice that that the curve will go up straight and then it will keep going up and this is a true stress true strain diagram. But if you look at carefully at this diagram which is for now for the example of uh, 
a material like BCC iron with carbon and the clear cut signature is seen in a phenomenon known as the yield point phenomenon. In the case of aluminum for instance which I draw here the material will show an elastic region and then it will slowly uh, the curve will bend and that means that dislocations are moving and continuing to cause plasticity. In this case what happens uh, even though if you look at this overall curve you will see you could you would have guessed that the material should start yielding somewhere here but because of this quartal atmosphere you need to apply an extra stress which is up, up and above this stress from here to here suppose I call this point A and I call this point B I need to or this point B is actually the upper yield point I can I have to apply this extra stress so that and this stress of course at the microscopic level can be drawn like this on this diagram. So, this extra stress has to be applied so that this dislocation can break free from the cotyl atmosphere and of course, repeated locking in this atmosphere can lead to a phenomenon known as serrated yielding. So, there is a serrated yielding and once the dislocations are free of this cotyl atmosphere then they can uh, this stress strain diagrams looks rather smoother. So, the entire presence of this yield point phenomena is because of this interaction of dislocations with the point effects in this case carbon in BCC iron. So, to summarize this slide if I were to uh, take a pure iron material and shear it then typically it will lead at stresses which are uh, uh, somewhere around A that means the uh, elastic to elastic plus plastic transition would take place at lower stresses. Now, because of the interaction presence of carbon the carbon is attracted towards the lower half of the edge of this extra half plane in other words. Um, our regions of higher free volume right here which is now in the tensile region of the edge dislocation and this segregation by actually by diffusion can lead to the cotyl atmosphere which implies that now I need to apply extra stresses above and above uh, what I would expect normally for a pure material and therefore, this leads to an yield point phenomena which is nothing but the locking of the dislocation by the carbon atoms. So, this is an important effect we are seeing the yield point phenomena coming purely from this interaction of an edge dislocation with point effect which is the interstitial atom of carbon. Uh, dislocations can interact with as I pointed out before can interact with any one of these long range stress fields um, and one important interaction is the dislocation precipitate interaction. So, uh, some of these interactions are very very important because we start off with the material if you say I take a pure material a whisker which is 100 percent free of dislocations we know that we can expect. Uh, yield stresses of the order of theoretical shear stresses. Presence of dislocations weakens the crystal and therefore, we have to find mechanisms by which we can strengthen the crystal. One of the mechanisms is actually add so, uh, substitution allowing elements which can actually raise your uh, lattice friction and therefore, uh, in other words give you a strengthening effect which is called a solid solution strengthening. Interstitial atoms will also give you this kind of a solid solution strengthening. The other mechanism which is very popular is the precipitation hardening mechanism in which you uh, produce precipitates in a material and these precipitates can give you a hardening effect. So, let us try to understand how the hardening effect of precipitate comes about and more importantly what is the dislocation precipitate interaction that we are talking about. So, precipitates are of three types So, we have three types of precipitates out here and um, the the coherent precipitate is a precipitate in which the atomic planes are continuous from the matrix into the precipitate. In a semi coherent precipitate uh, there are regions in which the atomic planes are continuous and there are regions where the atomic planes ends at the interface and that it can be interpreted as the presence of an dislocation and if we are talking about a precipitate which has a dilatationally uh, or which has a lattice parameter larger than the or larger or smaller than the matrix then typically this would be edge dislocations or edge dislocation loops in the around the interface between the precipitate and the matrix. Therefore, there are coherent precipitates where planes are continuous semi coherent precipitates which are associated with regions of continuous planes and uh, also with uh, the presence of interfacial misfit dislocations and there are incoherent precipitates wherein the atomic planes do not continue from the matrix to the precipitate. So, the mechanism by which a dislocation interacts with these kind of precipitates is uh, differs depending on the kind of precipitate we are talking about and one important point about coherent stress uh, precipitates is that they are also associated uh, 
with long range stress fields. That means, because there, there is a misfit in lattice parameter between the matrix and the precipitate, there is a stress field and therefore, you have a, uh, a stress field of the dislocation can interact with the stress field of the coherent precipitate. And as far as the uh, uh, normal stress interactions, they remain ident identical as far as the coherent precipitate. Like if you have uh, a tensile region, it will be attracted to the compressive region, if you have a compressive region, it will be attracted to the tensile region and therefore, there is no difference in that aspect. But as far as the dislocation interaction with a coherent precipitate goes, it is very it could be very different from that uh, as the way a dislocation would interact with a incoherent precipitate. And we will take up these two examples by the kind of mechanism by which they would interact. An important point to be noted is here, even though I said that there is an interfacial misfit dislocation present in the case of a semi coherent precipitate, we are not dealing with the interaction of that dislocation with the precipitate, what we are talking about is a dislocation which is present in the matrix far away from the interface, which is now moving towards the dislocation and trying to interact with this precipitate. But in this set of lectures, we will only consider the interaction of a uh, dislocation with a coherent precipitate and with an incoherent precipitate. So, what is the essential difference between a dislocation interacting with these two kind of precipitates? In case of a coherent precipitate, the dislocation actually can glide through the coherent precipitate and which will actually shear the precipitate. Now, why can it glide through? Because atomic planes as I said are continuous from the matrix to the precipitate even though they are distorted. In case of an incoherent precipitate, um, the dislocation cannot glide through the precipitate, it has to bow or bypass the precipitate leaving uh, certain loops in the wake of the moving dislocation. So, we will take up these graphically, so that we can understand these two interactions in a better fashion. The important point to be noted is that both these processes lead to an need an higher application of stresses typically and uh, and of course, I am assuming that the precipitate is typically harder than the matrix and this will lead to the strengthening of the material. So, precipitation hardening or precipitation strengthening uh, is a very important mechanisms, uh, mechanism by which a material can be hardened and therefore, you can sort of uh, increase the strength of the material as compared to the weakened state because of the presence of dislocation. Now, suppose I have a precipitate lying on the slip plane and now this is a coherent precipitate right here sitting on the slip plane. And now, I have a dislocation line which is shown in blue moving on the slip plane try, uh, coming closer to this precipitate. Now, I can actually uh, see this precipitate on the side view, wherein I have the dislocation line here and the dislocation is moving towards my right into the grey colored precipitate. So, what is going to happen? Since it is a co coherent precipitate, the planes are continuous from the matrix to the precipitate, even though for instance, this were an atomic plane for instance, this could get distorted in the and it could be still continuous. So, this is a typical kind of an atomic plane within from going from the precipitate to the matrix. So, when this dislocation moves through the precipitate, the section of the dislocation for instance, suppose now it has reached the stage, wherein I have a section of the dislocation lying in the matrix and there is a section lying within the precipitate. The section of the dislocation which lies in the matrix would feel a different resistance to motion as compared to that with which lies within the precipitate particle, because now the precipitate particles uh, is could be elastically harder and would therefore, be difficult and would have a different pearl stress and therefore, difficult to move a dislocation within the precipitate. Now, what happens when this dislocation leaves the precipitate is it creates a small step of Burgers vector B. So, within the it means the particle has now been sheared and therefore, it leaves a Burgers vector in its wake. Now, this means that the surface area of or interface area of this precipitate has increased and therefore, that would require a little extra energy and therefore, which would in terms of in other words show up as extra stress which we need to apply to move the dislocation. But in any case, the section lying within the dislo uh, precipitate would face a higher uh, uh, what you call pearl stress to move the dislocation and therefore, you will see a hardening effect even in the presence of the uh, even though the fact that the dislocation is actually gliding through the precipitate. Now, of course, the, uh, this is now so far ignoring the uh, long range stress effects, but there also be interaction of the stresses of the dislocation with the precipitate. Now, suppose I am talking about an incoherent precipitate and therefore, I come to a different kind of mechanism by which a dislocation can actually interact with a incoherent precipitate. So, now suppose uh, I consider incoherent precipitate and let me start with this diagram on the right hand side here, wherein I can see that these two grey spheres are grey circles are the incoherent precipitates and this is my dislocation line shown in red. And this dislocation line is now for instance this is my dislocation line here right here and this is now pinned at these two points, because if I am talking about a uh, precipitate here for instance, 
on my dislocation line moving, it cannot move into the precipitate as it is incoherent, there are no continuous planes. So, in other words, it is as if a different crystal sitting across the interface. Therefore, the dislocation gets actually pinned at these two points and therefore, it cannot move at those two points. Now, suppose I am applying an external shear stress, the stress would be felt at all the points along the dislocation line and these stresses would tend to bow the dislocation as shown in the figure on the right hand side. But if, I'm if I bow the dislocation, then the length of the dislocation line is increasing that means, the energy associated with the dislocation per unit length is also increasing. Of course, if I started off with a pure edge dislocation, now this dislocation would have a certain screw component to it. That means, only one point would remain edge and the remaining would become screw or if I am starting with a pure screw dislocation, then I can similarly argue that this curved dislocation has a mixed character. Now, applying this external stress, the external stress suppose has a value tau, it will try to balance the line tension, the origin of the line tension being the increase in energy associated with the dislocation line which goes as g v square per unit length of the dislocation. Now, suppose I keep increasing the stress, then what would happen is that the dislocation line would bow more and more, the segment which is unpinned, the segment which is free to move would in an increasing stress lead to larger, larger bowing. The upper limit for this radius would be the radius wherein this becomes a semicircle and entire process starting from figure for instance this point 1 to 2 to 3 will take place uphill in stress because now I am increasing the dislocation line and therefore, I have to contract it with my applied stress and therefore, I need to apply an additional stress to cause the semicircle. But beyond the semicircle, now if I look at figure 4, uh, this happens from beyond from point 3, uh, figure 3 would take place in downhill in stress and what would happen is that this dislocation line will take a, a shape as shown by this lighter blue line on this figure this figure here. So, this figure here you can see that it takes a shape like this and if this segment has a certain uh, sign of the dislocation suppose this is positive then obviously, this segment would have a negative sign and therefore, they would be attracted towards each other. At each point we have to remember that the line tension and the applied stress are opposing each other and of course, this is now going downhill hill stresses and finally, if the final picture would be this picture phi as shown here in which case you will have a original line segment retained, but additionally these two segments the positive and negative would come and cancel each other and this dislocation would take a circular shape which would give it the equilibrium configuration. So, because that would be the uh, for a given length of segment this would be the uh, what if I increase or cause any dents in this that will lead to an increase in length of the dislocation line and therefore, this is the configuration would adopt of the lowest energy and so at the end of this whole process of shearing I would notice that. I have a dislocation line segment which I originally started off with. So, you can see this is my original line segment which was pinned between A and B. So, I have this my A and B pinned segment remaining, but I have additionally created a dislocation loop. This mechanism as I pointed out is called the Frank Reed mechanism uh, or the Frank Reed double source as it is called um, or fra double ended Frank Reed source and this is creating an additional loop. That means, as the, the same set of same dislocation pinned segment can keep on operating again and again creating such kind of loops. So, again I applied shear stress then this whole process of bowing of the dislocation line can, uh, but now we have to remember this bowed segment has to interact with the stress field of the additional loop which has been created. That means, the second time I operate the same loop uh, same pinned segment to operate a double ended Frank Reed sword I have to apply an additional stress as compared to the first time around, but nevertheless I can keep on. Uh, operating this Frank Reed source and therefore, create more and more loops. So, we seen that, um, so this is just an example of an interaction of a, uh, a dislocation with incoherent precipitates. There may be other uh, important ways in which they can interact, but now we just consider two examples, one for coherent precipitates and one for incoherent precipitates. So, let me summarize this uh, dislocation precipitate interaction briefly that in case of coherent precipitates, the dislocation can shear through the state and even in this case we would observe some amount of hardening. But suppose you are talking about incoherent precipitate not only can the dislocation not shear through the precipitate, but would remain pinned at these two points the precipitate, but nevertheless it can bypass the, dislo uh, the pinned segments by creation of loops, but nevertheless the original segment still remains which can be operated further and further. And at some point of time if uh, this a b segment the stress to operate this a b segments becomes too much then there will be other segments uh, for instance suppose you would start with the longest segment which can be operated first then the shorter and the shorter. So, that we now go to 
smaller and smaller pin segments which require higher and higher stresses to operate and therefore, this also would lead to a hardening in the material now, because now you are not allowing a free motion of dislocation. So, both these mechanisms would lead to a hardening of the material and therefore, would constitute important uh, from the materials behavior perspective. Next we consider dislocation free surface interaction, um, the so far what we consider the dislocation stress field as maybe if you consider the figure here, you can see the figure here, this is a dislocation stress field in an infinite body, okay. but now suppose I have a dislocation sitting in a finite medium. So, now you can see that this is my body on the left hand side. So, this is my in surface free surface here and to the left of this free surface is my body. The entire grey shaded area is the uh, what you might call the vacuum if you like now or air for that matter. A dislocation near a free surface gets actually attracted towards a free surface and this can happen because now the dislocation stress fields is and in the presence of a free surface the dislocation stress fields which have this left right symmetry are is broken down it no longer has this uh, left right symmetry. So, in other words if I have a dislocation in infinite medium now this is my symmetry line the line right the middle, okay. but this kind of a symmetry is broken down in the presence of an free surface and now I can approximately draw my stress field in the presence of a free surface. So, now I have a this is my free surface and I have a dislocation present here. So, now my butterflies would have a certain kind of a distortion in the presence of the free surface. So, in other words now it does not have that left right symmetry which originally had around the dislocation line. Now, uh, the dislocation is will have to is attracted towards this free surface because the free surface is a traction free surface. In other words there are no tractions on the free surface. The force with which a dislocation is attracted towards an edge uh, free surface is given by this formula right here the F m and it is called the image force and it goes as 1 by d, where d is the distance from of the dislocation from the free surface. So, this is for an uh, image force experienced by an edge dislocation. So, this is an image force for an experienced by an edge dislocation. Similarly, a screw dislocation would also experience an uh, attraction towards a free surface. So, what is the reason that this dislocation gets attracted towards a free surface? This is the reason is that actually if a dislocation moves to the free surface it can relieve all its stresses and the energy of the system would be relieved except for the small step which is created. Um, so, therefore, as a dislocation moves towards the surface its energy reduces and this is the reason that the dislocation is attracted towards the free surface. So, now on the other hand suppose why is this called the image uh, force is because this is a kind of force which you might call a configurational force. So, let me write down this name for you. So, this image force is a kind of configurational force. So, the image force is a kind of configurational force which attracts dislocations towards free surfaces. Now, as I said the reason for the attraction is the lowering of the energy of the dislocation as it moves towards the free surface and finally, when it reaches the free surface it creates a small step and all these stress fields are relieved. On the other hand suppose I have a interface with a harder material then that will be a repulsive that means, now instead of having a free surface suppose I have a harder material on the other side of this interface. So, I have a dislocation here and now this is my harder material and I have a dislocation here. So, this is harder this is my softer material, then the dislocation would actually be repelled from this interface. So, I have my softer material on the left hand side, my harder material and dislocation sitting here going into the plane of the board, then this dislocation would be repelled from this interface, while well, on the other hand suppose you had a softer material or a free space here, then the dislocation would be attracted towards this free space, free surface. Now, the reason this is called an image force is that that suppose you uh, want to calculate the value of this force which is shown be here below, you would actually construct an hypothetical negative dislocation located at a distance d and now, now what I will do I will artificially not only construct an uh, dislocation of the opposite sign, but I will assume the material properties which are for instance g and nu on the left hand side is also maintained for this material g and nu. So, this hypothetical 
dislocation which I can I have constructed of the opposite sign. Suppose this is normally positive dislocation to the negative dislocation, there will be a force of attraction between the positive and the negative dislocation and that is why this is called an image force because now I have constructed an hypothetical dislocation of the at the same distance from the interface and now I calculate the force between these two and this dislocation is called the image dislocation and hence this force is called the image force. So, a dislocation can also interact with free surfaces and interfaces with harder or softer materials. So, this is an important point to be noted and if this force of attraction can exceed the, uh, the pearl stress then the dislocation would automatically leave the crystal and go and sit on the surface. So, we will actually make a calculation later of the value of this image force and the kind of interaction it can and kind of motion it can lead to. An important point to be noted here is that as a dislocation goes to the free surface, it can actually distort the free surface as well. So, if my dislocation here for instance gets closer and closer to the free surface and now my assume that if my extra half plane is located at the bottom, this is my extra half plane. So, I am extra half plane here a dislocation it is going towards the free surface, then the as it goes suppose to a very close to a free surface. So, this is my the free surface would be distorted in the presence of this dislocation would distort my free surface this is my extra half plane. So, this can lead to a distortion of the free surface. So, this is something which is to be noted. So, the image force goes as 1 by d that means the it uh, grows um, asymptotically as you approach the free surface. Now, dislocations uh, can also as I told you this is a small deformation which I was talking about in this case, but presence of dislocations in thin plates or uh, thin cylinders can actually lead to a larger kind of deformation and that kind of a deformation often cannot be ignored as compared to the small deformation of the surface which I just pointed out. Now, suppose I have a thin plate, now I am talking about dimensions of the plate of the order of nanometers and I have an edge dislocation sitting here and suppose I have a flat plate originally and then I introduce my edge dislocation going into the plane of the plate. So, my plate could be thin plate like this ok. okay. What would happen is that the pre very mere presence of this dislocation because now this dislocation is associated with an extra half plane would lead to the bending of the plate. So, the plate would bend because I have exaggerated the picture here, but typically if you have a plate of, uh, of a few nanometer it could even blend of a few degrees. But you have to remember now this bending is uh, coming because you are now introducing a dislocation into a flat place which originally was completely defect free. So, you can have uh, uh, what you might call deformations of this type which are purely elastic deformations coming from the presence of dislocation. So, this is something which again is important to note. Uh, a screw dislocation unlike the edge dislocation leads to this uh, twisting of the material. Suppose, you had a cylindrical domain and you introduce a dislocation at the center of the cylinder, then it will actually lead to a twist in the uh, cylinder which is coming from the presence of the dislocation.